Chapter 27 The first work of the Advent body in their disappointment was to re-examine the 2300 days of Daniel's vision. But they were unable to discover any error in their calculation. It was still evident and clear that it required every day of 457 years before Christ and also every day of 1843 years after Christ to complete the 2300 years of the vision on which the Advent movement started from 1840. It was also clear that the year must correspond and terminate with the Jewish sacred year. At this important crisis, the Advent Shield was published, reviewing all the past movement, especially the prophetic periods, showing that we had followed them down correctly. We quote from Volume 1, Number 1, page 87. Quote, we look upon the proclamation which has been made as being the cry of the angel who proclaimed the hour of his judgment is come. Revelation 14, verses 6 and 7. It is the sound which is to reach all nations. It is the proclamation of the everlasting gospel. In one shape or other, this cry has gone abroad through the earth wherever human beings are found, and we have had the opportunity to hear of the fact. Joseph Wolfe, according to his journals, between the years 1821 and 1845, proclaimed the Lord's speedy advent in Palestine, Egypt, Mesopotamia, Persia, Georgia, throughout the Ottoman Empire, in Greece, Arabia, Turkestan, Hindustan, in Holland, Scotland, and Ireland, in Constantinople, Jerusalem, St. Helena, and in New York City, to all denominations. Close quote. Voice of the Church pages 343-344. From the foregoing historical facts, the unbiased reader will not fail to see with what wonderful speed the glorious doctrine of the second advent of our Lord and Savior spread throughout the whole habitable globe, and then ceased as suddenly with those who were proclaiming it as daylight with the setting sun. Those who were engaged in this most solemn work were some of the honest and faithful from all the churches— said the Advent Shield, page 92, quote, No cause of a moral or religious character probably ever made such rapid advances as the cause of Adventism. Its votaries have been the most humble, pious, devoted members of the different churches. Never have a set of men labored more faithfully and zealously in the cause of God, or with purer motives. Their record is on high, close quote. While in this tarrying, waiting position, searching and praying for light on the track of prophecy, it was further seen that our Lord had given the parable of the ten virgins to illustrate the Advent movement. In answer to the question, What shall be a sign of thy coming and of the end of the world? Matthew 24, verse 3. Our Lord pointed out some of the most important events with which the Christian church was to be connected from the time of his first to his second Advent, such as the destruction of Jerusalem in A.D. 70, following which was the great tribulation of the Christian Church for more than 1,600 years under pagan and papal Rome. Then the darkening of the sun in 1780 and the falling stars in 1833. From thence the proclamation of his second coming in his kingdom, closing with a description of two classes of Adventists. And then shall the kingdom of heaven be likened unto ten virgins, Matthew 25, verses 1 to 13, which took their lamps and went forth to meet the bridegroom. The words, Kingdom of Heaven, undoubtedly refer to the same portion of the living church which he was pointing out in chapter 24, verses 45 to 51, who continue in their history with the same proclamation of his second coming. And all the way to verse 13, in every important move they make, their history is likened or compared to the history of the ten virgins in the parable, namely, tarry of the vision, tarry of the bridegroom, midnight cry, behold the bridegroom cometh, etc. Soon after the tarry of the vision of 2300 days, the second angel's message began to be proclaimed. See Revelation 14 verse 8. While moving on in this message into the summer of 1844, the definite time for the close of the vision began to be taught. But the leading ministers opposed. 
a camp meeting was appointed to convene in Exeter, New Hampshire, on the 12th of August. On my way there, in the cars, something like the following was several times very forcibly presented to my mind. You are going to have new light here, something that will give a new impetus to the work. On my arrival there, I passed around among the many tents to learn if there was any new light. I was asked if I was going to the Exeter tent, and was told that they had new light there. I was soon seated among them, listening to what they called the midnight cry. This was new light, sure enough. It was the very next move in Advent history, if we moved at all, wherein Advent history could be fitly compared to that of the ten virgins in the parable. Verse 6. It worked like leaven throughout the whole camp. And when that meeting closed, the granite hills of New Hampshire were ringing with the mighty cry, Behold, the bridegroom cometh, go you out to meet him. As the loaded wagons, stages, and railroad cars rolled away through the different states, cities, and villages of New England, the cry was still resounding, Behold, the bridegroom cometh. Christ, our blessed Lord, is coming on the tenth day of the seventh month. Get ready, get ready. After an absence of five days, I returned home to Fairhaven in season for an evening meeting. My brethren were slow to believe our report respecting the new light. They believed they were right thus far, but the midnight cry was a strange doctrine to connect with Advent history. Sunday morning I attended the Advent meeting in New Bedford, some two miles distant. Brother Hutchinson from Canada was preaching. He appeared much confused and sat down saying, I can't preach. Elder E. McComer, who had returned with me from the camp meeting, was in the desk with him. He arose, apparently much excited, saying, Oh, I wish I could tell you what I have seen and heard, but I cannot. And down he sat also. I then arose from my seat in the congregation, saying, I can, and never do I remember of having such freedom and flow of words in all my religious experience. Words came like flowing water. As I sat down, a sister came to me across the hall, saying, Brother Bates, I want you to preach that same discourse to us this afternoon. Brother Hutchinson was now relieved from all his stammering and said, If what Brother Bates has said is true, I don't wonder he thought my preaching was like carpenter's chips. When the meeting closed the next evening, stammering tongues were loosed and the cry was sounding, Behold, the bridegroom cometh, go you out to meet him. Arrangements were quickly made for meetings to spread the glad tidings all around. On the 22nd of August, S. S. Snow issued a paper called The Midnight Cry, setting forth all the points in the types, with the calculation showing that the definite time for the ending of the vision of 2300 days would be on the 10th day of the 7th month, 1844. Following this, at camp meeting in Pawtucket, Rhode Island, Elder J. V. Himes and several of the leading Advent ministers pressed their objections respecting the genuineness of the midnight cry. But before the meeting closed, they were returning to their stations, and a few days after, the Advent Herald was heralding their confessions and how all their objections were removed and their faith in the cry steadfast and unwavering. We have not space here to present the arguments by which the midnight cry was sustained, but so convincing and powerful were they that all opposition was swept before them, and with amazing rapidity the sound was heralded throughout the land, and the poor discouraged souls who had slumbered and slept while the bridegroom tarried were awakened from their apathy and discouragement and arose and trimmed their lamps to go forth and meet the bridegroom. All hearts were united in the work, and all seemed in earnest to make a thorough preparation for the coming of Christ, which they believed to be so near. Thousands were running to and fro, giving the cry and scattering books and papers containing the message. But another sad disappointment awaited the watching ones. Shortly before the definite day the traveling brethren returned to their homes, the papers were suspended, and all were waiting in ardent expectation for the coming of their Lord and Savior. The day passed, and another twenty-four hours followed, but deliverance did not come. Hope sunk and courage died within them, 
for so confident had they been in the correctness of the calculations that they could find no encouragement in a re-examination of the time, for nothing could be brought to extend the days beyond the tenth day of the seventh month, 1844. Nor has there been to this day, notwithstanding the many efforts of those who are continually fixing upon some definite time for the coming of Christ. The effect of this disappointment can be realized only by those who experienced it. Advent believers were then thoroughly tested with various results. Some turned away and gave it up, while a large majority continued to teach and urge the days had ended and that duty would soon be made plain. All, excepting this latter class, virtually rejected their former experience and in consequence were left in darkness relative to the true work of the Advent people now to engage in. Those who believed that the time was right and had really passed now turned their attention to the examination of their position. It soon became apparent that the mistake was not in the time, but in the event to take place at the end of the period. The prophecy declared, Unto two thousand and three hundred days, then shall the sanctuary be cleansed. We had been teaching that the sanctuary was the earth, and that its cleansing was its purification by fire at the second advent of Christ. In this was our mistake— For upon a careful examination, we were unable to discover anything in the Bible to sustain such a position. Light begun to shine upon the Word of God as never before, and by its aid a clear and well-defined position was obtained on the subject of the sanctuary and its cleansing, by means of which we were enabled to satisfactorily explain the passing of the time and the disappointment following to the great encouragement of those who held fast to the message as being of God. The nature of this work forbids an examination of that position in these pages, but we refer the reader to a work entitled Sanctuary in 2300 Days, published at the Review Office, Battle Creek, Michigan. We were also greatly cheered and strengthened by the light which we received on the subject of the three angels' messages of Revelation 14, 6-12. We fully believed that we had been giving the first of these Fear God and give glory to Him for the hour of His judgment is come, and that the proclamation of definite time, that mighty movement which roused the world and created such a general and widespread interest in the Advent doctrine, was a complete and perfect fulfillment of that message. After the passing of the time, our eyes were opened to the fact that two other messages followed before the coming of Christ. The second angel announced the fall of Babylon and the third giving a most solemn warning against false worship in presenting the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. In close connection with the giving of the first message, we became convinced that the fall of Babylon indicated the moral fall from the favor of God of the nominal churches which rejected the light from heaven and shut out from their places of worship and from their hearts the doctrine of the advent because they had no love for it and did not desire it to be true. The first and second messages being given, attention was now turned to the third, and an an examination as to its nature and claims was instituted. As before remarked, it contains a most solemn warning against the worship of the beast and his image, and presents to notice the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. By the expression, commandments of God, we understand the moral law of Ten Commandments, which has been recognized by the Church in all ages as binding upon mankind and containing those moral precepts which regulate our duty to God and to our fellow men. This being made the burden of a special message just before the coming of Christ, coupled with such a solemn warning, renders it apparent that the Church must be remiss in the matter and that some gross error in regard to the commandments of God must lie at their door. A careful examination of the practice of the Church reveals the fact that the fourth commandment is not observed, as it enjoins the seventh day of the week as the Sabbath, while almost all the world have been keeping the first day. Hence the necessity of a reform in this matter. Before Christ comes, his people must observe all of God's commandments and thus be prepared for translation. An investigation of the claims of the Sabbath brings to view the following facts. Number one. God in the beginning sanctified the seventh day, and no other as the holy Sabbath, because that in it he had rested. Number two, 
Having sanctified it, he commanded man to remember it and keep it holy. Number three, we find no record of his ever having removed the sanctity from that day or that he ever transferred his blessing from the seventh to the first day of the week. Number four, we find no intimation in the Bible that man was ever released from the obligation to sacredly observe the day on which God rested. Number five, our Savior, in his example and teachings, recognized the claims of the Sabbath and declared that it was made for man. Number six, the disciples and apostles observed the day by holding meetings and preaching upon it, calling it the Sabbath and recognizing it as the day for Christian worship. Number seven, the New Testament uniformly speaks of the seventh day as the Sabbath, while the first day is never once honored by that title. Number eight, the term first day of the week occurs eight times in the New Testament and never in connection with any intimation that it is to be kept holy or observed as a rest day. Number nine, leaving the scriptures, we find by reliable history that the early church observed the seventh day as the Sabbath until, corrupted by the apostasy, the first day of the week began to be observed in compliance with the customs of the heathen world who observed Sunday in honor of their chief God, the Son. Number 10. The first definite commandment ever given by a lawmaking power for the observance of Sunday was the Edict of Constantine, a pagan ruler who professed conversion to Christianity and issued his famous Sunday Law, A.D. 321. Number 11. The Roman Catholic Church adopted the Sunday institution and enforced it upon her followers by pretended authority from heaven until its observance became almost universal. And Protestants, in renouncing the errors of the Romish Church, have not entirely rid themselves of her unscriptural dogmas as evinced by the general observance of Sunday. In the light of the above facts, the message of the third angel assumes an importance entitling it to the serious and candid attention of all Bible believers, and especially of those who profess to be making a preparation to meet the Lord at his coming. And as they were presented to the attention of those who had been giving the two former messages, those who were moving in the counsel of God and recognized his hand in the work thus far, and in the disappointment being itself a fulfillment of prophecy, gladly embraced the truth and commenced keeping the Sabbath of the Lord. Although at first the light on this subject was not one-tenth part as clear as it is at the present time, the humble children of God were ready to receive and walk in it. From that time the progress of the work has been steadily onward, rising in comparative obscurity, rejected by many who gladly embraced the first and second messages presented at first by but few preachers, struggling along in want and poverty, contending with the opposition of many and the prejudices of all, it has gradually and steadily worked its way upward under the blessing of God until it now stands on a firm foundation, presenting a connected chain of argument and a bold front of truth, which commend it to the consideration of the candid and thoughtful wherever the message is preached. It is now twenty-three years since we commenced keeping the Sabbath of the Lord, since which time we have endeavored to teach it to others, both in private and by public labors, by the fireside and from the sacred desk. We have presented this and kindred truths in New England, many of the western states, and the Canadas, and our labors have been blessed by seeing scores and hundreds turn from the traditions of men to the observance of all of God's commandments. By the untiring efforts of our esteemed brother Elder James White and his companion, who were pioneers in this work, there is now established in the city of Battle Creek, Michigan, a well-furnished office of publication owned and controlled by the Seventh-day Adventist Publishing Association, a corporate body engaged in the publication of this message. The association employs two power presses in carrying on its business and issues the Advent Review and Sabbath Herald weekly, the Youth's Instructor Monthly, the Health Reformer Monthly, and a large assortment of books and tracts on various Bible subjects. In closing this work, I desire to express my gratitude to God that I am permitted to bear a humble part in this great work 
and while my past life has been a checkered and eventful one, it is my earnest desire to spend the remainder of my days in the service of God and for the advancement of His truth, that I may have a place in His soon-coming kingdom, and that reader and writer may meet in that happy abode is my most earnest prayer.'" 